Right, welcome to the Morris Federation series of online workshops during lockdown. Uh, my name is Pauline Woods Wilson. I'm president of the Morris Federation. And Frank Lee has been making wrapper swords in the UK and for the international market as well since 1977. And today he's going to show us how it's done. So over to you, Frank. Yeah, right. OK, <laughs> that's where most of the action happens. Um, there's, there's going to be no high tech stuff here, as you can probably see by looking at that photograph. The nearest I get to high tech is a po uh, pocket calculator. Um, as I said earlier, this is a really a three hour talk I'm trying to condense into one hour. So I'll rattle off like an auctioneer, I'm afraid. Um, and uh, shout at me if I go into anecdotes, if you're not muted, Pauline. Uh, <laughs> So, um, right, I'll just kick off straight away with, uh, with the, uh, the processes. So first off, making a swivel handle. Um, I'm starting with the uh, a block of wood, which is four and a half inches long by an inch and a quarter square. I need to mark the center of that and, um, and bore a hole down the middle because that's gonna go onto, onto the spindle of the wrapper. Uh, the way I mark the center is with the marking gauge um, from each side this requires no skill you can literally do it with your eyes shut and you get a far more accurate result than if you did it with a rule so um, that's the final result I guess the middle and the uh, the distance between those parallel lines is the extent of my error but I know that the center is right in the middle of that tiny little square um, so then the next thing is to drill it I'm going to have to keep shifting this box out of the way, uh, so it might be a bit irritating, I'm afraid. Um, I'm drilling it with a 17 64th of an inch drill because that's slightly bigger than quarter of an inch and we don't want the, the handle to jam on the spindle, so it wants to be a loose fit. So I'll, I'll keep fast forwarding these things and cut out the crap. Um, so that's actually drilling the hole. Um, after I've drilled that hole, I'll then counterbore it three eighths of an inch because there's a bearing goes in the, in the end of it that's uh, nearest the camera now. And then I'll counter counter bore it because um, it needs to go on the lathe and the uh, mandrel that drives it is uh, seven sixteenths of an inch. And also I need a, a larger clearance hole there for a collar which uh, stops the handle actually falling off the wrapper when it's finished. So um, that's it with the, with the uh, small hole drilled in it. That's with the counter bar and the counter counter bar. So that's that hole there is the one that takes the bearing. This is the clearance hole for the collar. And um, before I put it on the lathe, it saves a lot of time if I cut the corners off the block. Fortunately, in the violin department, there's a bandsaw, so uh, I just uh, cut the corners off on that. The next job to do on this is to put it in the lathe. Shut up. <laughs> um, so I just I'll fast forward that. It's pretty obvious what's going on. So there it is with the corners cut off. Uh, so that saves about, I don't know, 15 minutes on the lathe or something like that. Um, so that's the mandrel that drives it. This is the, uh, the, the chuck. The, the smaller end of the mandrel goes in the 3 8 hole. The bigger end goes in the 7 16 hole. And... Um, and this is the bit where I'm actually fitting it onto the lathe. I'm going to shift that out of the way. Um, yeah, this is just uh, putting the, the mandrel in the in the chuck. Um, at the other end, there's a conical center, which would tend to split the wood because it's conical. So it works like an axe in a way. Uh, so I have to put a brass um, spacer in there. It's a brass support, really, which is what I'm doing there. And then it goes in the lathe and the center goes up to the brass support. And then I can turn it um, without fear of the things smashing. So I'm going to turn that into a, a, a cylinder with a smaller diameter at the end, which will eventually take the ferrule. Um, I'm, I'm turning that almost to the right diameter, but uh, I'll correct that later on to precisely the right diameter. So this is what I end up with. Um, <clears throat> Nothing much on that video apart from that. <clears throat> I'm going horse already. Uh, the next thing to do is to profile it. And uh, this is the profiling procedure. This is a dummy handle, which is supported where the blank will go eventually. 
And if you sort of join the dots on the tops of those fingers, you'll notice that that is the same as the profile there. So what I'm going to do is bring the cross slide. If you're familiar with lace, you know what I mean. If you're not, it's this this rectangle thing here underneath everything. That's all going to come towards me, towards you. Uh, and then I'm going to flick the fingers over and rest them on the wood. So I think I can, I think that's in this video. Yeah, there. And then I'm going to move the whole cross slide away from me until those fingers all drop. Theoretically, they should all drop simultaneously, but uh, the world's not like that, and they'll drop one at a time. Um, but nevertheless, they all drop within about half a millimetre of each other, so that's fine. All will become clear in the next video. So I'm moving it very slowly forward now. There they all go, right? So I can now remove that dummy handle and replace it with my blank, which is this, and then flick all these fingers back over again until they rest on the blank there one of them has been naughty and it's fallen off already it shouldn't do there's one there which has fallen because that bit of the of the blank happens to be the right diameter already so that finger's got no further work to do the rest will all drop as i um as i chisel the thing away so i'll uh, i'll fast forward that and so on and so on and there, there they go now I'll keep losing this little slider. So that's basically it done. And then I trim the ends up and then put the finger grips on it. I never throw anything away. This is probably one of the reasons I've ended up starting to make wrappers in the first place. Um, the the uh, tool that I've just used to put those finger grips on is a roller bearing from a Land Rover prop shaft. If you've ever had a Land Rover, you'll, you'll know you spend more time under them than driving them, uh, repairing them and fitting new bearings and goodness knows what. So I'll give it a go over with garnet paper and, um, and that, that's it really. And that's a day's production. So after that, it's the metal work. This is my forge. Um, it's a lorry brake drum and uh, the, the, the bit in the middle the stainless steel part that's the old school fish fryer uh, they, they decided to scrap the school catering uh, system of the kitchens and uh, turn them into a classroom so i got all the stainless steel uh, kitchen furniture and uh, well stored it for whatever it might be useful for and and it's very useful for this because stainless steel doesn't burn through and that's going to get very hot um, it's designed for use with a vacuum cleaner to provide the blow, the, the blast underneath the fire. Uh, in fact, I, I found the vacuum cleaner was far too powerful. It was a, a one horsepower motor, uh, whereas what I needed was a, a hamster in a wheel, really, which would provide enough blast for this job. Um, and the school was also throwing out a, a Variac, which is a voltage control unit. That's it, about 200 quid's worth of Variac, which is just in the skip. So I, I half inch that. Um, I'll uh, fast forward that and just I'll just turn that up. You'll hear the blower. And that's connected to this uh, blowing motor, that thing there, which I picked up in a flea market, which happens outside our house every Wednesday. So, um, so that's ideal. And so the cord is now lit. I don't really need to see that. Uh, so the next thing I do is to start uh, forging the bolsters and there are two sides to the bolster and this must be about the simplest forging job you can possibly do. You just heat this three quarter inch by an eighth inch steel uh, bar and forge it to a fishtail and then cut it off. Um, so I'll uh, flick through that again and uh, And I occasionally have uh, people coming here to learn how to do it. So this is Jeremy Carter Gordon from uh, Massachusetts uh, doing the same thing. He stayed with me for, a, a, I don't know how long was it, Corey? About a month or something? About three remember. months. <laughs> Corey says it wasn't that long. It was, it was three months. Was three months. But, all right, okay. But anyway, during what, whatever time it was, he made a set of wrappers and this is him doing it. So the next thing after that is to cut it off on the guillotine both of them so this is back to me again 
and there is one of the one of the bolster cheeks and there are two for each wrapper and that's a day's production all arranged in the tin so after i've made the bolster um again i'll flick through this i need to drill the three holes in it where the rivets are going to go uh, they're going to go right through both cheeks eventually and through the sword, uh, the, the uh, sword blade. Um, and also, if I shift this out of the way, you can just see there I've ground away part of the edge and along the bottom and up the other edge as well. Again, I can fast forward that and make it a bit clearer. Um, come on, why does it move? There. So you can see there the, uh, the, the ground edges. When the two sides of the boats are cheeky together, they form a valley, and uh, that's where the welding material goes to, to ensure adequate penetration of it. Um, so I clamped them together with a piece of broken wrapper blade between them, because eventually uh, a new wrapper blade is going to go in that gap, uh, and it has to be precisely the right um, thickness. Um, then it goes into this jig. If you do metalwork, you end up making hundreds and hundreds of these things. And in the end, you forget what they're for, and you have to <laughs> you have to make a label or write on what what they're for because you completely forget. Um, so uh, it just goes in there with its broken bit of wrapper blade sandwiched between the two halves. There, and then uh, and and this whole thing swivels. It, it's pointing to the left at the moment. Then it goes vertically. Then it goes to the right as I. Uh, well different bits of it so this is me doing that I don't know whether this will uh, harm anybody's eyes <laughs> when it's on a screen I imagine not so uh, there it is welded together so uh, and let that cool down and then i'm going to put it in the milling machine after i've extracted that bit of blade and uh, and cut a notch in the end of it the notch is to take the spindle when i get that uh, cut and welded into it um so this is the milling machine which is effectively just a circular saw with a quarter inch thick blade um and the the bolster is now out of sight almost just underneath the the spindle there so uh I just wind that forward while the thing's spinning. It makes a heck of a noise. Um, I'll let you hear it. Uh, and so on and so on and so on. And I end up with... Uh, with that. That's the, you can see, yeah, you can see the notch there. So that now goes into another jig, and that's the spindle, which I'm fitting into the notch, and then I'll weld that in. And that's what it looks like after the spindle's just been welded, which is uh, quite a mess. So there's a lot of work to do now. Uh, that has to be filed down, and, uh, and then the uh, riveting done, and then the whole thing's got to be filed and filed and filed. The whole, the whole job takes about an hour and a half to do. Um, I've managed to cut out this most of these the um, elbow grease work with with this job, just removing the bulk of the weld. I got a shaping machine because I happened to be on hand when the cigarette lighter factory went bankrupt in Cramlington and uh, sold me a, a shaping machine for next to nothing. Uh, and that, that's a very slow thing but at least it's automatic so it can just be batting on doing the job while i'm getting on with other stuff so um this is the shaping machine uh this is a ram which moves uh, backwards and forwards the bolster is there you can just see it mounted in a in a special holder which is mounted in a vise which is bolted onto this block this anvil that moves backwards and forwards this way while that moves backwards and forwards that way the cutting tool is that and uh and it just slowly shaves off the top of that weld so um, um it, uh, it. 
So that all takes a few minutes, but as I say, it, it just gets on with it while I'm doing other stuff. Um, I don't think anything else happens in this video. No. So yeah, so this is, now it's time to cut the blade. Uh, you might wonder what this is about. Well, when I get the, 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 um, the spring steel, it comes in coils and uh, this is me unloading it. Fortunately, I don't have to do this very often. I get several coils at a time. So this is a coil, I'm unloading it into the attic uh, through the skylight and that's an electric hoist. These coils weigh about 25 kilograms, 25 to 30 kilograms each. Um, there'll probably be eight of them in a consignment. And from the bottom of our house, from the driveway up to this door, that's a front door, there's, there's 20 steps to there. And then there's four more flights of steps up to the attic and lifting eight lots of 25 kilograms is a lot of hard work. Um, so, so um, yeah, fortunately, as I say, I don't have to do this too often. Um, one of the good things about this medium is that I don't have to work too hard at keeping a straight face. Um, we happen to be having the chimney stack rebuilt at the time, so that's the reason why the scaffolding's there. So it's just absolute serendipity. <laughs> Normally I have to do the work of humping them up the stairs. Uh, that's a consignment of uh, wrapper steel. Um, right, so here it is in its dispenser. Uh, this is a half used coil um, in effect this is like a big tape measure wrapper steel is actually clock spring um, and so you can see there the the, the steel coming at the bottom of, of the uh, dispenser to load it into that I have to I have to load it first of all onto this cassette the wooden part and then put the cassette in the dispenser which is this rectangle thing here um, the steel for that literally fell off the back of a lorry in Brampton and uh, my headmaster thought ah Frank will need that so he kindly gave it to me that was the, the headmaster who appointed me he was really keen on metalwork because his dad was a blacksmith um, anyway so that is just pulled out of the bottom of the coil unfortunately it's a very dark photograph but that is the blade there it, it comes out until it hits a length stop which depends on uh, the, the customer's requirements the, the, the soil I'm making in this demo is for a guy called Anthony Robb, who um, is probably quite well known to a lot of you, he's a very well known Northumbrian piper, certainly in the northeast and probably well outside that as well. But anyway, um, so I bring it down to the, the length stop and then just bring that handle down and, and cut it off to length. Um, you might be wondering um, how much energy is stored up in this. This is actually, in effect, a, a, a huge clock spring. Um, and loading it up into the, that cassette is a pretty terrifying business. Um, bear in mind that that's what I start with. Um, I once let it get loose in the kitchen and uh, the, <laughs> it knocked me straight to the floor. Um, I escaped major in injury. I, I ended up with bruises on my hands and, uh, and face. Um, it smashed a couple of windows, broke an awful lot of crockery knocked pans off shelves and uh, generally filled up the kitchen and it took uh, Angela and me, uh, that's my first wife, a whole day to coil it back up again and, and get it back into the cassette. Um, so uh, yeah, just a warning in case you're thinking of going into this business. <laughs> uh, right, okay, so changing subject slightly. This is the three rivets that, that will be used to, to uh, fix the blade into the bolsters. They're no longer the right length. You can't buy them the right length anymore. Everybody's rationalizing everything. So they have to be machined in the lathe. So that's one that's just been shortened. And right, now it comes to uh, fitting the bolster. So there's a blade in the vise. And what I'm going to do is put the bolster on the end of it. Again, I think that's in this video. Yeah, there's a... Ah, come on, stop. Right, you can see there where the, um, the shaping machine has removed most of that weld and I've drilled right through both sides of the bolster now and countersunk the holes to take the heads of the rivets. So I'm going to put the, the bolster, there yeah, I've done it now, on the end of the steel and mark through the holes where, where the uh, rivets are going to go with a felt tip pen. There it is, I've done that. 
because I can't punch the blade as it is. Uh, drilling it is totally out of the question. Punching it is dodgy because uh, it, it's very, very hard and it's likely to shatter. So I have to soften it. But if I soften it even a millimeter too much, then the soft part of the blade will be included in the, the active part of the blade when you're dancing. And if that happens, it's going to break within about an hour. So uh, I, I must include all the soft metal within the bolster. So that's a matter of putting it in the vise uh, and using the vise as a heat sink uh, so that the, it stops the heat from traveling any further than I want it to. So um, here we go with the blowtorch. How am I doing for time? Mm, halfway through. No, I'm not. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's just softening it. And skip that. You, can, you all know what a flame looks like. Um, Frank, have you got time for a question? Uh, okay, as long as it's not <laughs> no, it. just because you, you're dealing with the blade, and of course it's come off a a, a coiled roll, and they yeah. end up straight. And I wonder if there's any heat treatment involved in getting the blades to sit straight once you've finished. No, the the blade comes off the coil dead flat. Right. Which is why it caused such havoc in the kitchen. Because that coil that I showed you earlier, all it wants to do is turn itself into a flat strip of metal. Right. Which it does in, a, in one second if you let it get loose. So the heat's only so you can drill it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thanks. Right. So there it is, heated up. The, the, that's the two marks where the rivets are going to go. Um, again, I don't think you need, Oh, yeah. The, the, this is the punch. Sorry, I, I didn't realize this was included in this video. That's the punching machine. No idea what that was from. I got it in an auction sale and thought that'll come in handy for something. And um, it's uh, it looks a fairly hefty thing, but it's nowhere near strong enough to, to punch uh, spring steel. So I've had to reinforce it with this channel iron and tie bars here. Um, so the punch itself, um, I can come to it. That's the body of the punch, but the, 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 the head of the punch, the business end, screws into that. Where is it? There we go. No. Yes. No. Yeah. <laughs> that's uh, that's the punch for the fixed handle holes, which is seven millimeters in diameter. That's the one that I'm going to use now. Again, the punch. I, I used to make these myself with a success rate of about one in every five because I haven't got any sophisticated tempering equipment here. And doing it by color, which is the traditional method of doing it, just wasn't uh, accurate enough. So uh, there's an awful lot of time wasted making punches. And I discovered that the good old Land Rover prop shaft bearings were exactly the right thing. So that's a prop shaft bearing, which I've ground at the end to a, a sort of a V point, And it makes a perfect punch. They last for about, uh, I don't know, maybe about 100 wrappers before they, they're either blunt or they disintegrate. So that then screws into the punch body. Do I do this there? No, probably in the next video. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I've screwed it into the punch body. I've put the handle in. I put a, a pipe on the end of the handle because it's not long enough. There it goes. And then uh, do the punching. Oh, this, this bar wouldn't <laughs> move every time I try to operate the slider. Anyway. Yeah, I think uh, that's in the next video. I don't know why I included that. That's my angle poise light. Like I say, I never throw anything away. So um, that is uh, fixed to the ceiling with an old rowing machine. So I can slide that along to uh, the milling machine and my um, grind wheel and the workbench as well. Right, okay, riveting, I think. Uh, da da da. Yeah, I've put the rivets in place there. Um, they need knocking firmly into place with a thing called a rivet dolly, which I will do now. That, that's the rivet dolly I'm holding in my right hand. Just give that a good belt with a hammer. Just squeeze everything together as tightly as it can go before I start the riveting process. So um, that's We're simply knocking them flat with a, a ball pin hammer.
I haven't done that. Brrr. <laughs> so uh, that's it done. You'll notice the um, the anvil is a bit of old railway track. If you think you're thinking of going into this business, I'm sure network rail and the passengers won't notice if you nick six inches out of a railway track if you've got an angle grinder. Um, so there it is, riveted. And uh, now for the hard work. This now needs uh, rubbing down with um, how many grades? I think it's about six grades of, of abrasive. It starts off with aluminum oxide, 40 grit, then 80 grit, then 180 grit, then 240, then 400, then 600. Um, and then it's got a further three uh, grades of polish to do on a polishing wheel after that. But in the middle of that process, I'll stamp my name on it. Um, my father always used to say, if you make anything and you're not proud to stamp your name on it, you should throw it in the bin. So uh, I bought a name stamp <laughs> and tried to make sure that everything's worthy of my name. A bit of uh, commercial stuff there. Um, so yeah, in the middle of that job, I'll, I'll stamp my name on it. That's the name stamp. Um, you might wonder about why the string. Uh, that will become clear now. Um, here we go. Uh, hit that with a, with a hammer. I don't know what point I do that. Here we go. Oh, this is me complaining about the quality of files these days. You don't need to know about that. But you can nearly see your face in that file, and it's uh, I've only been using it for about an hour. So this is the, uh, the the name stamp operation. Four pound hammer. Come on. <laughs> I don't know how to waste a lot of time on this. Right, now you know why it's uh, attached to a bit of string. That can go anywhere from... Uh, a foot away from me to 20 feet away but if it's a tattoo with a string i know exactly where it's gone so the name is now stamped on it so now it's got to go through a few more um grades of abrasive uh the reason for that is that the the name stamp throws up a burr all around the lettering so uh the the, the, the abrasive removes that so that's after about the um after about the 400 grit i think so then after that it's uh it's got that surplus metal sticking out of either side of the bolster yeah you can see it there and so that needs grinding away which i will now do on the grind wheel there it goes and then after i've done that the grind wheel marks need removing, which I do on a garnet paper drum, which is mounted in the drilling machine. The surplus blade is now removed. So, uh, whiz through that. And then after I've done that on both sides, it's ready for the for two more of the uh, of the grades of polish. I don't give it the final polish until almost the last job I do because uh, it's going to get damaged during the course of. Uh, further operations so uh, I, I, I do the final polish last um, don't know what I'm doing here oh yeah this is just the final the final grades of polish the the, 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 the last two of the of the three um, that's pretty self-explanatory So what am I doing now? Yeah, I've uh, I've done the polishing, the last two grades, and I've also jumped the gun a bit and softened the other end and punched the three larger holes for the fixed handles. You don't need to know about that. That's uh, that's a different punching jig that I made, which doesn't apply to us. Right, the fixed handles. This is a friend of mine up in uh, Hallbank Gate, which is an old redundant pit village just up the hill from me. He's got a woodworking shop and he's busy uh, sewing up a, a plank of elm uh, for the fixed handles. I use elm because um, I don't know if you've ever tried to chop elm for firewood, but basically you can't. Um, well, you can, but it all breaks up into little chips rather than uh, nice straight lengths. 
and uh, and that being the case, it's fairly suitable for fixed handles, which come in for a lot of punishment. It still chips and it still breaks, but uh, it's less likely to do so than almost any other wood, apart from really exotic woods, but they tend to be too heavy anyway. And that's another reason why I use elm. It's, uh, it's quite important to keep the weight down with wrappers, otherwise when you hold the lock up at the end of the dance, it all collapses under its own weight. Um, and the only thing you can do, having done that, is to, is to make the swords a bit shorter and uh, the, the moment of force then isn't so great and so the, the locks tend, tend to stay stable. And so he produces these strips which are then cut up on the crosscut saw into four inch lengths. Uh, you don't really need to see what a saw looks like, but there it is anyway. Um, uh, oh. Don't know why that's there. That's a counter-boring thing, which I'll come to later. Homemade again. Um, it's it's for producing the the sockets for the tea nuts and uh, cup washers uh, when I fix the fixed handles. But I'm coming to that shortly. Um, so this is actually drilling the three holes. It's not quite as straightforward as just drilling three holes. They've got to be exactly the right distance apart. So I've marked the center line. And I now put it in the drilling machine, organize it in that this this wooden jig so that that center line is exactly under the drill. And then um, then start drilling the first hole, but then I'll let it run and, and you can see what happens. Uh, I put a spacing block there, uh, that thing there, between the end of the handle and this depth uh, end stop. And then remove that spacing block and put a bigger one in and drill the third hole. And then after I've drilled those three holes, I'll then use that counter-boring thing, which uh, you saw a couple of minutes ago, and uh, counter-bore all the holes for the uh, for the sockets. There it is again. So that's counter-boring the, uh, the three holes. And I'll do that on both sides. And there's a, a day's uh, fixed handles. Right, uh, I'm going to make the bearings for the swivel handle now. Um, this is a very simple job in the lathe. First of all, I centre drill it with that thing there, which is a centre drill. Um, I, I won't bother explaining what that is. You can ask later on, but it's not very important. Centre drill it, then drill it with a 1764th drill so that it's a free fit on the, on the quarter inch spindle. Um, and then just part it off. Uh, I'll let you see what happens there. I'll speed it up a bit. That's the center drill. That's the drill. And then I uh, then I part it off. I bring it up to a depth stop first of all, and then that's the parting off tool coming in from the back now. But before I part it off, I'll chamfer one end of it just to make it go into the hole a bit more easily. Uh, so I'll do that with a flying file, which is this thing here. All kinds of flying uh, files, as warding files, smooth cuts, bastards. That's a flying file. Um, so uh, that's done its job. I then make another one to, for the other end of the of the handle, and then I make a spacing collar between that goes between the bolster and the swivel handle. Pretty much the same operation, but that is a is a dome shape. So I'm using a a tool with a corner cut out of it, you can just see it there. That simply moves forward and uh, and produces a, a dome on the end of the... Ah, it's a bit quick, but never mind. Take my word for it, I did it. <laughs> and after that, I'm going to replace that uh, collet with a 7 16 one, because the uh, the T-nuts and the, and the screw collars will be made of 7 16 um, brass. So this is making this screw uh, the screw cup washers now are the colours. So the special tool that I've made which drills it, countersinks it and counterbores it all in one go. The screw's getting blunt as well needs replacing really. I think it's got some uh, straw trap on it stopping it from cutting.
So I'm going to bring the, the padding off to it now. Fast forward again. There it is. Chamfer it before I finish padding it off with the flying file again. So forth and catch it with a subscriber. So I'll make three of those for each fixed handle. And there's Aito who's at the bottom of some of your screens right now in Tokyo. <laughs> She's uh, she comes and visits us from time to time and uh I was busy at the time, so she uh, volunteered to do some bearing making. So she's doing that job that I've just shown you. So there are the three cup washers, the two bearings and the, uh, and the spacing washer. That's just a block of wood, works like a chemist pill counter. Uh, it helps me to count uh, components when I'm making lots of them. So there's about 20 rows of five holes there. So that helps with that. Right, now for the fixing the the fixed handles these are saw handle screws which were the things i used at first very difficult things to get um and i found a saw doctors in north shields who had them and i went and asked uh, if if they sold them and they said no they didn't but uh, how many did i want and i said well I, oh, I don't know i don't need about a dozen i said so they looked up um the price of them agreed to sell me some and the price of them was three shillings and sixpence in 1953. And so they uh, they said, oh, well, allow a bit for inflation. So we'll charge you 30 pence. Will that be all right? So that's now six shillings in old money. So I said, yeah, 30 pence will be fine. So I bought a dozen of them and then eventually used them all and then went back for some more and bought some more. And then I went back again and I got this distinct feeling I was being treated like a, a turd in a trifle. And it turned out that I'd bought them completely out of their own stock, which they needed. And uh, they'd had to buy some new stock. And now they cost two pounds each and they'd sold me them all for 30 pence each. So it <laughs> was very popular. So I had to think of a way of avoiding going back there again. Um, so th these are the tea nuts that I make. And that replaces these things. And the cup washer and the screw go on the other side of the fixed handle. So to make these tea nuts is probably about the most complex operation that I do in the whole process, really. And I've got a, a capstan now, which fits under the lathe. Um, fast forward to where it is. There it is. Um, I'll, let, I'll let myself do the talking the on the video. Is, is the talking sure working the okay on the video, Pauline? This green thing. Good. And what that basically is, is a carousel of tools. Uh, there's a, a centre drill in that one, a tapping drill in that one. That's the depth stop to check the, the, the length of the nut. That's to turn the nut down to 7 millimetres diameter and that is to catch it when I part it off. So I'll show you how it works. Uh, a bit noisy I'm afraid. With the centre drill. Now the depth stop. So when I release the clutch, the collar check I should say, the, uh, the stop will slide along to the right until it hits the depth stop and then I'll know that the finished nut will be the right length. Turn it down to seven millimeters. Then chamfer it. That's number one, two, both leading edges. Yeah, that's chamfering uh, both that edge and that edge because they 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 both hit wood when they hammered into the uh, into the handle, so they both need to be chamfered. One. But I need to bring this catching tool up first. This is just a proper tube, but it, what you can't see is a, a big hole in the back of it. So when I bring the parting off tool up and it slices the nut off the end, 
Let's go get to the tube. And then we're going to bring the next tool up. The tube flings around and empties the nut into the basket behind it. There we go. I'll do that all again. One thing about this, uh, this slicing and uh, chamfering tool is it's got a, an adjustment screw on the back of it. Um, so what I've done is I've arranged the, the desktop calculator behind it so that, that adjusting both hits the equal sign. And I've got it set at the constant plus one. So every time it hits the equal sign, it adds another one to the total. And then I know how many of these nuts I've made. Uh, the so I'll just keep doing that until it's counted a bucket full. Uh, automatic bar feed, to a kind of a Heath Robinson device like a lot of things in this workshop, um, consists of, uh, I don't know if you can see this, there's a weight, this here weight, it goes up and, and around a pulley and back down uh, around another pulley here, along inside this tube and it, it's attached to the end of a plastic rod which then comes back out through the tube which is this thing here. And as soon as I release the, uh, the handle, you can see the, the uh, stock slide forward and with the, with the uh, gravity provided by that weight. Mm. Like that. Okay, that's far too far forward. I'll have to push that back across me just to uh, let you see the principle of it. Okay, so that's that. Uh, I would normally do maybe about five or six hundred of those at a time. Right, so here's Bob Davies from Sally Pot doing exactly the same job. Nothing much to add. That's a like a day's work. Uh, so those are all blank nuts. Uh, but they're not nuts yet because they haven't been threaded. So uh, in order to thread them, I've got a thing called an archer tapper, which is this thing here. Um, quite a clever device. And I've arranged another collar chuck underneath the drilling machine. Uh, so the, 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 the nut blanks go into that hole there that I'm pointing at, uh, press the, uh, the handle down and clamp them in place while I bring the tapper down. The clever thing about the tapper is it screws itself down into the brass and cuts itself... Uh, a thread and the instant I bring it back up again it goes into reverse so it unscrews itself because there's a gearbox in this black thing here which which does that job so um, I don't know if you'll see it uh, actually going into reverse when, when I uh, bring it up but it might be possible oh that's just me explaining what a tap is but I needn't go into that so uh, to reverse and unscrews itself. Yeah, this is me explaining what I, I just said. That'll be uh, visible on the on the video. So I've clamped a, another collar chuck just below it. Blah, blah blah blah. You've heard all that already. And uh, another very noisy machine, I'm afraid. But I don't know if you'll see it flicking to reverse when I lift it up. But you might. I said that as well. Right, and here's my able assistant doing it for real.
etc. So all I do then is uh, fix those three components, the three cup washers and the three T nuts into the wood, just tap them in with a hammer and then uh, force them onto either side of the, uh, of the blade and then put the screws in. And after I've done that, they go on a linishing machine, which is that, uh, and that just um, linishes the wood flush with the, with the brass fittings. Uh, and then I round off the end of the fixed handle and then finally put them on a sm small spindle molder to, uh, to round off the corners. Do I? Yes, I do. And I put it on. No, I didn't have to put it So that's that job done. There it is. Right, so back to the other end again. Oh, back to uh, swivel handles. Uh, all I'm going to do here is paint it black. Uh, I'm using waterproof drawing ink for that. If you use wood stain, it comes off on your hands. And not only that, it costs a fortune. Uh, black Indian ink uh, is, is waterproof and uh, the, being waterproof it doesn't come off on your hands so um, I'm just going to rotate Meanwhile, that in the, the lathe the swivel handle. And, um, and paint it um, sorry about the delay here I, I lost my little paintbrush I think and uh, yeah as I say you, <laughs> you always find things in the last place you look but I, I disproved that by um, finding my car keys once and then looking in half a dozen more places so it doesn't always apply but uh, uh, you all know what uh, I'm assuming you're all still awake and uh, you can cope with with watching paint dry uh, come on where is it gone oh sorry it's frozen again I think it does this oh and what to do I'll come out of it and go back into it Know where I am. Yeah, there we are. Yeah, but the jobs are good, so off it comes. Right, so this is making ferrules, uh, just a long tube of brass which I part off in five eighths length in the lathe. Uh, that's the business end of it. Um, this is actually doing it, but it's not particularly interesting, so I can skip that, I think. Uh, then I need to round off the uh, leading corner of the ferrule at one end and countersink it at the other, so that it goes on the wood more easily. Um, that's rounded off the corner. That's countersinking it. And uh, now what am I doing? Yeah, that's, that's just it done. The next thing I have to do is stamp the serial number on it. Um, I think I'll do that in this video. No, I don't. Yeah, this one. Um, I stamp a serial number on because I keep a record of every single sort I make because uh, sometimes I change the processes, sometimes I change the uh, the steel that I use or, or any of the other metals or even the wood sometimes. Um, and I, I keep a record of that on my computer so that if... Uh, problems start arising or if, if if dancers start complaining that something's going wrong I can think I can look back and think ah oh, yeah well that's when I changed to this method and I know to, to do something about it um, so that's just a punching jig uh, not particularly interesting but put the punch in that square hole and um, this is sword number 2594 Just goes in there. Hit it with a hammer. 
I seem to be doing this in slow motion. <laughs> Just getting impatient, I think. So anyway, so that's it done. And then I have to machine that uh, that that spigot down to exactly the right diameter. Uh, I actually show how to do that. It's quite a, a, a tricky process. It has to be a, a push fit. And to get it to push fit means it's got to be accurate to within about a thousandth of an inch. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so I'm just going to machine that down. There it goes. And that will now be a push fit into the... Uh... I see, I've just run out of time. It's five o'clock. <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> um, so anyway, I'm near the end now. So I'll, I'll push the um, the collar onto the or the ferrule rather onto the end of the handle. Um, you would think uh, with the with the uh, spigot on the end of the handle being parallel and the bore of the tube being parallel that that would go on straight, but uh, the law of eternal cussedness uh, operates here and will defy me to put it on straight so i've made this little gadget to sort of teach it manners and uh, so the tube goes into the into the gadget there and that spindle thing spigot goes down the bore of the handle and then i squeeze them both together in the vise and that's it fitted so now i've got to bore out the end of the handle to take the other three eighths bearing so this is a drill which is slightly smaller than three eighths so that when the bearings put in it's a tight push fit, which also has the added benefit of making the ferrule an even tighter push fit than it was to start with. Um, so after that, uh, that's just clearing out the mess inside the hole. This is fitting the uh, the bearings. These two little things here. I don't know why I didn't get closer up with this, but anyway, that's the way it is. Uh, they just to hold the handle while I fit the the bearings. Put a put the bearing on a kind of an insertion tool that's it there stand that on one of the uh, the, the guides and knock it with a, a soft faced hammer that's it and then I do exactly the same thing with the other end so uh, don't need to show you that uh, oh, bef before I fit it to the to the blade I punch a, a serial number on here, it's not, not a serial number, a batch number, which in this case is 433, so that's how many sets I've made to date. This will be uh, sort of one of the of the 433rd set. Um, pretty straightforward, I don't need to show you that. Uh, there's a, two of the number punches there. Um, <laughs> I, I've tried to avoid the, the use of the phrase, here's one I made earlier. Uh, but I've, I have to watch <laughs> on that now because when I made the video of doing that particular job uh, the camera the, the phone had set itself onto selfie mode so I actually made a video of the workshop ceiling while I was doing the job so this is uh, this is one of the earlier ba batch that I made when I did a, uh, a, a series for Facebook so this is surplus metal now sticking out the top that needs cutting off to within a millimeter of the top of the of the handle so to do that I just rest a, a bit of old wrapper blade on the top of the handle, which is a millimeter thick, rest the blade of the hacksaw on that and put a mark on the end of the spindle, then put it in the vise and saw it where the mark is. And now back to sword number 433 again, uh, that is now exactly the right length. Meanwhile, I've made a collar in the lathe, which will be a push fit on that. Uh, and I think I actually show that being knocked on in this video. Yeah. Um, that's it pushed on it oh, jumped the gun a bit um, yeah I'll go back to oh, wrong button there we go again right I'll, uh, I'll I'll just let that run or paint hammer same process as riveting And that actually produces quite a sharp edge around that uh, the end of that rod, so I need to use a, a kind of a bell mouth punch on the top of it, which rounds it off. 
I'm not aware of anybody that's actually cut their finger on that on that edge yet, so I'm hoping that it, it never actually has happened. Um, so that's the bell mouth punch thing. And at this point, the the uh, the whole lock will be firmly locked solid, so that handle won't turn. Um, so what I do is take it out of the vise, hold it in my hand, and whack the end with the hammer. And now it'll swivel, and very little play. And that's it. Done. Finished. That's it. There it is. Um, well that's, done. Uh, that lot is just waiting to go in the post, but uh, COVID decrees nobody's uh, in too big a hurry to get their wrappers anymore. So I'm going to have a posting day sometime this week, I think, and uh, and get that lot in the post. That's a, um, that's a map of where all my customers are in this country. Um, it's a map of... I'll enlarge it a bit. The more you enlarge it, the more dots there are because a lot of them are superimposed on each other. Uh, Lots in North America. Yeah, that's just uh, me explaining where they've gone. They've, they've gone to... Uh, yeah, well, Lots uh, in North America. Canada. Some in Australia. New Zealand as well. Most countries in Europe. Um, China, Taiwan, Japan. So there's a, an innovative lock that uh, an American team made. I think it might have been cutting edge, some of who I think are watching this, but uh, they can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I think they were the first people to do that. And I was amazed to find they actually do that during the dance. It wasn't, uh, wasn't contrived at all. Um, and that's it. That's just a more general view of the, of the pig style that I work in. Um, so yeah, so that's it, finished. <laughs> Jenny, can you unmute us? Give a round of applause for Frank. <laughs>